Tonight we are very privileged uh, to have a speaker who uh, many of you know. He's from Traverse City originally. Uh, you can uh, find him at the Davos International Conferences, uh, um, rubbing elbows and lecturing and talking to world leaders uh, every year in the winter. Uh, they very wisely hold their conferences at Davos, which is a ski resort in January. Uh, and uh, uh, he is uh, someone who is going to talk about a, a subject that we don't necessarily give much thought to. I'll just give you one little piece of uh, information to have in the back of your mind. The civil war in Syria, which is one of the great tragedies of our generation, it started because of water. In uh, back four and a half years ago, the Turks began to divert more water f out of the Euphrates River, and it caused a drought in northeastern Syria. And this, the people were suffering from this, and their all-powerful dictatorial government failed to do anything about it. And they began to protest, and the protests led to violent reactions by the government, which led to more protests, more violence, and it spun out of control. And now we are, as you see today, a absolute disaster. And you can trace it all back to water. So with that introduction, I, it is my great privilege to introduce Carl Ganter, Circle of Blue. Well, thanks so much, Jack, and thank you for the, uh, the introduction there, too, and about Syria. Um, and, uh, and I also have to thank the International Affairs Forum for hosting this incredible series here in Traverse City. So I was at Summer Davos in China last weekend and talking to a, a, actually a staff member of the, of the World Economic Forum. I gave him my card. He's from Finland. And he said, Traverse City, I spent my exchange student year at Traverse City Central High School. So, so there we go. Um, and it's so great to be with so many friends here. And I just want to give you a hint, too. We'll be graded on tonight's performance. Um, I have to point out my, my fifth grade teacher, Ann Rogers, is here. So, so. so anyway, so, so turn your slips into her, and uh, we'll see how we do. And we're all graded, so we're all together there. And I have to point out to uh, Jim Olson, if Jim is here, Hans van Sommeren and Constanza Hazelwood um, of the NMC Water Studies Institute are heroes of the Great Lakes. And if they're not here in this room, um, they are probably next door with the students, where the pizza is. So if you're hungry and not really thirsty, um, the pizza's next door. But we're going to get out of the classroom and go orbital. Um, I'm a journalist. I'm also a photographer. And another one of my editors is here, Gil Bogley, um, the Record Eagle, where I started working when I was in ninth grade. So I was one of those kids who was a thorn in the side. So we're going to take a tour of our water planet. I thought that'd be a lot more fun than, than showing a lot of numbers. Um, and uh, I'll just take you on my itinerary, if that's OK. And, but we're going to start up high. And we're going to start, we're going to go orbital here. So, you know, Jerry Leninger, who's here, another Traverse City resident, um, who at one point stopped in our office and we were on a conference call with a China expert. And I said, Jennifer, Jennifer Turner, who's been to China more times than anybody can count, I said, I'll bet you I've got somebody in the office who can beat you. And I said, Jerry, how many times have you been to China? And I think Jerry said something like 1,200. But he was talking about orbits. <laughs> So he spent four months, and I didn't let Jennifer know until the end of the conversation. She was trying to figure that out the whole time. So he spent four months aboard the Soviet space station Mir, and it was a real test of survival and creative uses of duct tape. And I'd encourage you to read his book. <laughs> but as he says, it was a closed ecosystem. And just because I, I love this quote so much, only so many sources of life-sustaining water and all the creatures of Earth, just like the three of us circling it all, or circling it, all depending on water. So looking down, you can imagine being in this, in this little spacecraft and 
making your drinking water from sweat and urine in a closed loop, closed loop system. So we'll start off with a quick question here. Um, how much does NASA pay, or at least this is what another astronaut told me, how much does it cost NASA to take water into orbit? Is it a dollar a liter? You can raise your hand for that. Is it four dollars a liter? Do I hear four? Maybe 4,000 a liter? 4,000 a liter, okay. That's coming from Fiji. Um, $50,000 a liter. Uh -huh. So you're absolutely right. It's all in the delivery cost. So that's pretty pricey delivery cost. So as I said, to save taxpayer money, so they recycled the water. So sweat and urine, Jerry was doing his part in space. The ultimate closed system. So okay, one more time, one more quick poll, a little personal one. How many took a shower this morning? You don't, okay, great. All right, so for Traverse City, how many people know where that water came from? Raise your hand. All right, that's great. Because, you know, here in Traverse City, this is actually, it was coming back from the Middle East and flew in, and you might recognize there is Sutton's Bay, or that's, sorry, that's the old Mission Peninsula, there's Sutton's Bay right there. So what a nice relief to see the bays, but I had to go all the way to Chicago to come back home. Um, but let's say you were in Phoenix, where I was speaking at an event to a bunch of basically hedge fund investors and investment bankers, and I asked the same question. And I said, how many people know where their water came from for the golf course or the shower they took this morning? Only two people out of about 500 raised their hands, actually knew where the water came from. So I was ready for that. At least I thought it'd be kind of fun. So what I'd done the day before is I chartered a plane and I put a couple of GoPro cameras on the wing to show them where their water came from. Because it's real, I think it's really important to know when we're talking about the value of water. So about an hour before sunrise, we took off from Deer Valley Airport, not far from Phoenix, and we flew along the Central Arizona Project. It's the largest aqueduct system ever built in the US. And it starts, starts at Lake Havasu on the Colorado River. And six, I have to say this carefully, six, 60,000 horsepower pumps move water up about 900 feet. These pumps would pretty much touch the ceiling here, the size of the pumps through more than 300 miles of canals and tunnels to Phoenix and Scottsdale. So the electricity, this is another just really interesting point that stunned me when the, the, the guy from the Central Arizona Project had to come with me because we wanted to fly over the nuclear plant and we needed somebody with me. Um, it uses more electricity in a single day than 140,000 homes use in a year. So a lot of energy to move water. That makes the Central Arizona Project the state's largest single consumer of electricity. And just for comparison, they don't pay $50,000 a liter there. Water is actually very cheap, and the price in general doesn't reflect the true cost or value to the environment, the people, or the agriculture. But it does show that a few hundred miles of concrete canals and really serious engineering can shape a landscape and build cities, even raise beef and grow cotton in the desert. So I asked my um, the guy sitting in the back from the Arizona Project, I said, he, he asked me, he said, so where are these pictures going to run? What's the story going to be? And I said, well, I will, I'll say that the canal is almost done to the Great Lakes. And he said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> he said, we get a call probably every week um, from people, why don't we plug into the Great Lakes? And then we get a call from the Great Lakes saying, don't you dare. Um, but the assumptions are changing. So the morning before my talk there, I, I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and drove south to the Gila River Nation. And perhaps the most important name in water in the southwest uh, United States is the governor of the Gila River Nation, Stephen Lewis. And the, the, the Native American population has not exercised their water rights fully. So you can imagine the insecurity that he caused when he declared 2015 the year of our water and our water rights, actually, to be, to, to be correct there. But what was so interesting is we were standing there at sunrise in the bed of this dry river, and he said, he's a Harvard educated, and he said, you know, I came back because we can be the most sustainable nation in the world. And I thought that was really, uh, really uplifting because here we're talking about, about water, we're talking about water as a scarce resource, and he is saying, we'll exercise our water rights, but we'll use them in the most sustainable way possible. 
But going back to orbit, yes, we do have a problem. Uh, we've mentioned Syria already, but globally, we take water for granted. And most of the world isn't quite so lucky as we are. So just a quick little touch point. In Ghana, uh, a little girl like this, a four-year-old girl, will spend several hours a day carrying water. Well, she's one of about a billion people, that's with a B, that don't have access to safe drinking water on the planet, that actually have to carry their water. Most of the water they carry is actually contaminated, will make them sick. And she's also part of the two billion people on the planet that don't have a safe place to go to the bathroom. They don't have sanitation. So when you don't have sanitation, the water and sanitation, it's obviously you can't separate the two. Um, you don't have sanitation, you don't have clean water. So at the World Economic Forum in Davos, as, as Jack mentioned, um, I'm on the Global Agenda Council for Water Security. And so we've been looking at water issues around the world. We've been looking at how do we bring them together? How do we talk about them? Well, we poll the Economic Forum community and then also globally. And for the first time in history, water crises, and I have to emphasize a little victory. We got that changed from an I to an E. There's a little editor points here. From crisis, and sorry, it's a little hard to read here, the slide. But water crises ranks number one. And that's above uh, stress, let's see here, that's above stresses of uh, weapons of max, mass destruction, um, trying to read uh, climate change, uh, let's see, energy price shocks. Water came out number one. So those of us in the Water Council felt, yes, we're relevant, finally. Um, but it really is the annual survey that puts the rope around the 10 top things we should be worried about. Water ranked third a year ago, so it's, it's, it's trending, so to speak. Um, but impairments to water supplies and dangerous cycles, sorry about this slide, it's hard to see here on this projector. Um, drought and pollution, water pollution hang, rank higher than nuclear weapons or even global diseases and pandemics. And their water challenges are now being viewed by heads of state and even nonprofit leaders and chief executives, some of the world's largest companies. Um, are really battening down the hatches, so to speak, and looking at water as you know, the number one risk to their business, to society's stability, and also to the environment. But it's really a remarkable shift the last few years. You know, we have the, this, this kind of uh, little mind map here, large-scale involuntary migration, profound social instability, again, all these cheerful things, um, spread of infectious diseases, failure of national governance. They all tie to water. And as one public policy expert told one of our reporters, we didn't realize, this is the public policy expert, we didn't realize recently until how much our economy and society relied on hydrologic stability. Okay, think of that, just kind of rather, rather common sense. Well, maybe not until you actually think about it, until it actually goes dry, or until you start to look at the places in the world where the aquifers are actually dropping. Now, if you look, so there's northern China, there's northern India and Pakistan, there is the Middle East, there's North Africa, there's even the southeast United States. And of, of course, California is there in the, in the red as well. But this is where the aquifers are dropping. These are, the, these are their early warning signals, the signs of, in a sense, what's to come unless we really start stewarding our water much better. So the evolution of world power. Um, as Jack said earlier. So when we look at, we look at Syria, Syria is a water, driven by a water crisis. So um, when I went on the net to find some good pictures, I've not been to Syria, but to find some good pictures, you know, it's heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking, um, the, the forced migration here. And if you look at this little girl and her father being passed over the fence, she's clutching, clutching a bottle of water. Um, and that's one of the first pictures, per, first pictures you see when you Google the, uh, the crisis. So at Circle of Blue, um, we cover these issues globally. We take you to the front lines. So that's what I'm, what I'm going to do tonight. So again, I'm a photographer, I'm a reporter. I thought it'd be fun to share a little bit of my itinerary and some of my, some of my snapshots and end with a few observations about the global story of supply and security and where we're headed. So, Remember Jerry Lininger in Mir, the spacecraft? Well, looking down from Mir, he, he, could, see, he could see the entire planet changing you know, before his eyes, as it does every day. But he could also see dust storms like this one over Inner Mongolia. And you know, when Jerry talks about looking down on the planet, looking down on the circle of blue, um, he would see these dust storms. And I'd say, boy, I wonder, I wonder what would happen 
if you had a spacecraft like Mir and you actually dropped a string down from Mir? Who would be at the bottom of that? You know, who is living this life? How, is, how are things changing? Um, so if we dropped a hypo hypothetical string, as my sister knows, who's here, she knows, well, I don't do anything hypothetical. I'll actually drop the string and go find out. So here's what you would find if you dropped the string from Jerry's spacecraft over Inner Mongolia. You'd find some of the largest coal mines in the planet. And you'd really find the epicenter for, for China's entire coal industry and also the dust storms as well as China's water problem. These coal mines are draining, draining the water supplies and because it takes a lot of water to mine and process coal. But you'd also meet somebody like Wu Yun, an, you know, the daughter of an inner Mon Mongolian shepherd. But you'd also see over her shoulder a coal mine, and you'd see another coal mine. These are buttes. These are t buttes taller than Sugarloaf here. These are probably 1,000 feet, 1, feet high. And then you'd find out that their well has gone dry because the coal mines have drained the water because the processing plant you see in the back here uses, uses huge, huge amounts of water to wash and process the coal before they ship it to Beijing and around the country. And so now the Shepherd family has to drive this tractor 15 kilometers about once a week to get water for their sheep and their horses. So this is really the epicenter for, for, this, for the water, China's water challenge. So it's really simple math in China. We looked at, we wanted to look at this challenge between water and energy in China and see, you know, does China have enough, uh, enough water to continue mining and processing coal? Because China generates 70% of its electricity using coal. So imagine if you don't have water, you don't have energy. So we really found three crucial trends affecting China and China's water energy, the uh, energy demand and fresh water supply. So we're seeing a rise in annual water use, so by 12% uh, rise by 2020. They used 30% more water than in 1990. Uh, that was to, in 2010. And in Ningxia province, one of the largest uh, coal producers in China, uh, water supplies to farmers have been cut by 30% since 2008. So we're already seeing this tension. So at Circle of Blue, we were the first to really reveal that China does not have enough water to continue mining and processing coal at current rates. So what does China do? China does things big. So this is another project that Jerry could probably see from space. It's the largest infrastructure project on the planet. It's the South to North Water Transfer Project. And these giant tunnels bring water from the south, from the Yangtze River, under the Yellow River, because the Yellow River is, river is too polluted, up to Beijing and up to the coal fields in Inner Mongolia. They've just started, they just started filling the canals last, uh, last year. But what else is Beijing doing? Well, China is doing some really interesting things. They're starting to close the loop as, uh, with their wastewater. So wastewater is not, is not wastewater. It's only wastewater if you let it go. China is going to do what Singapore does, and they're going to treat their water um, for back to drinking water, at least back to gray water for other uses. But what else is China doing? We hear of China investing in, in other countries. Well, in Australia, they're investing heavily in coal mines. Well, why would they invest in coal mines when they have coal in Inner Mongolia? Because there's water in Australia. So they're offshoring their coal and, and food footprints, so to speak, to other countries, to South America, to Australia, to Africa. So again, it's hard to underestimate or overestimate the water and food and energy insecurity in China. So a couple key points. Again, with China being the largest economy on the planet today, 60% of China's groundwater is polluted. Let's imagine that here. We wouldn't stand for that. So and compare that to the global average per capita freshwater availability, China has a quarter of what most other countries have. And then we don't know how much energy is used for China's water sector. Those are numbers that are hard to get out of the Chinese government, whether or not they track it. But we do know that about 2.3% of the GDP is lost due to the water crisis, to China's multitude of water crises. And we also know that by 2030, the water demand will exceed supply in China by 25%. So what do you do when you need to generate energy, when you need to grow food? Pretty significant stresses emerging. So in Australia, 
pop back here. In Australia, we spent several weeks in the Murray-Darling Basin at the peak of the drought several years, years ago. This is Gilbert Bain here trying to cut wheat. And his wheat was a real stubble. I literally flagged him down when he was driving his combine, trying to really just grab a few heads of, heads of wheat off, of, off the field. Um, but it's really no news to anyone that the Murray-Darling Basin underwent this massive drought. You remember the fires that rolled through. And I spotted this rice paddy from a plane, hit the GPS, and we landed. And we went and interviewed the farmer. He was growing rice basically in the desert, very dry area, using groundwater, using groundwater pumped from underground. And he complained. He said, well, I have to drill my well deeper every year for groundwater, for growing rice. But that's not happening anymore because what is really news is that Australia re-engineered, because of the drought, because of the stress, they re-engineered its entire water system. Everything's automated now. Everything's monitored now. They've, even, they've changed the policy. Water is actually valued properly. So our rice farmer in the, in the dry areas there, it's much more valuable for him to trade his water rights than it is for him to grow rice. So if we head to the Middle East, uh, Keith Schneider, our senior editor, and I went to Doha, went to Qatar, um, to have a look around at the invitation of the, of the government and researchers there to learn about their water challenges. And they are great, because Qatar is a desalination. This is what a gigantic natural gas-fired power or a desalination plant looks like in Qatar. And they have three of these. So if you're in Doha, all of your water comes from a desalination plant one of three. But also, if you're in Doha, what happens if the desal plants go down? They only have 1.8 days of water security before they run out of water. So imagine that. So if a plant fails, if they have a mechanical failure or another failure, they have 1.3 or 1.8 days. But I thought it was really interesting. This is, this is downtown Doha. So the grass is green. Even the buildings are green. And this is in the desert. That's desal water. So we also went to India to look at really the intersection between water and food, water and agriculture. And I really love this picture, um, this, this gentleman outstanding in his field. And I, I went out at, at, uh, at sunset. And the metaphors are literally dripping off the picture because he's out moving water around. That's, that's flood irrigation, OK? That's not very efficient. Well, that's flood irrigation from groundwater, water pumped from underground. Well, the farmers have such a strong lobby, they've lobbied for free electricity because now they have free water. What do they do? They leave their pumps running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because the electricity is free. So then the water has no value, except they pump it because if they pump it, they feel that their neighbors will pump it. So millions of farmers are draining the aquifer unnecessarily. And the, the, uh, the concentrations of pesticides and fertilizers are increasing, and the water table's dropping. And again, they're complaining that they have to drill their well deeper. But we're getting with better with big data. Um, this is the big data center of the Punjab Department of Irrigation. If anybody's seen the closing scene from Indiana Jones, um, I walked in this office, and I was very careful not to awaken anybody. Um, <laughs> But I thought this was just amazing. This is the big data center for the Punjab Department of Irrigation. This is how they track their water supply. That will change. India will have to change because nature is pushing back with force. So the base to the Himalayas, we sent, we sent uh, Keith Schneider, and a, our senior editor, and a, and a photographer um, to document eight dams that had failed over two days at the base of the Himalayas. Um, the glaciers are surging. So this dam is. 100 feet high, and the water is surging over top of it. It took them six months to dig out the turbines at the base of the dam. So nature is, is pushing back, and so India is going to have to re-engineer their entire water structure and water thinking. So besides catastrophic effects um, of you know, glacial melt and changes in, in, in climate and water supply, we have some really big changes happening in the corporate sector as well. So this is Catamarca, Peru, where I went to visit one of the world's largest gold mines, uh, the Numat Mining Company. It was really, really interesting because here you had literally get out of the cab and there was a demonstration, not for us, just a, just a demonstration, 
um, against a new mine called the Conga Mine, a $5 billion investment they'd started construction on. But because of missteps in the past, uh, the local community would not let them continue building this mine, the farmers, because they were worried about the water contamination and water use. So the old go it alone strategy for mining or for really any industrial practices, that's over. Um, right now with everything from social media to protests to whether they're violent or not, um, it can shut down a major company, particularly a publicly traded company. Coca-Cola saw that in India because the generations will be watching. And this, this grandmother and her granddaughter uh, were really interested in what we were doing, but more interested in the quality of the river and, and the water supply. Well, closer to home, we took a crew to Mexico and we went to the Tehuacan Valley. Absolutely fascinating place um, where a lot, of, uh, a lot of the world's chickens are raised. You wouldn't imagine in this, in this area, but these are chicken farms and they're gigantic wells here and they pump the water through and wash the excrement through and it comes out over here. Well, what happens when you do that is you're draining the, the water table and the villages up valley are going dry. The wells are going dry. And we visited these farms and we walked through. Nobody else was there except for us and the chickens. And we literally walked through gigantic wells, 14-inch wells, pumping water consistently. But what's happening is these farmers, for the first time in their recorded history, are having to buy water because their wells have gone dry. And they're also, we heard about, we've, we've, we're seeing the migration happening in Europe right now, but it's also been happening in Mexico and other parts of the world. Uh, Francisca Rosa Valencia's well has gone dry, her corn crop failed, and her son and her nephew left town. When we saw her, it had been a year since she'd seen them. Last she'd heard, they were headed toward the U.S., so she never knew if they made it, at least as far as we knew. So when we come back home to the U.S. and turn to water scarcity, um, all we have to do is look at Lake Mead and this bathtub ring. Um, this was a year and a half ago when I was out there, but today it's at 1,081 feet um, uh, above sea level. If it gets below 1,075, then we have shortage declarations on the Colorado River. So that would affect everything all the way downstream, including the Central Arizona Project and California's water supply. So then also, uh, last year, we took a look at, we wanted to look at three really key points, choke points in the U.S. Where are the biggest stories happening with water and agriculture in the U.S.? And so we took a look, of course, at California. We were a little ahead of the curve there as it was happening. The Great Lakes and the Ogallala Aquifer. Well, in the Ogallala, how many people have seen crop circles, of course? These aren't alien crop circles. These are irrigated crop circles. And in the middle of each one is a well. And these wells are tapped into the Ogallala Aquifer. This is a map of the central United States. And these are areas where the aquifer is, is declining significantly. So we are draining one of the largest water supplies and aquifers in the, in the United States. And we hear a lot about Nestle. We hear a lot about Nestle and bottled water. Well, the chairman of Nestle will pound his fist on the table and say, no water for fuel, no food for fuel, meaning don't grow, don't waste your water in the central United States to grow corn that will be either stockpiled or turned into uh, biofuels that, that may not have the right value. So when we're talking about the value of water, we're seeing really interesting conversations happening. And then, of course, we all saw, probably heard about the, the algae bloom in Lake Erie. So in 2014, last summer, 400,000 people went without water for three days. And the algae bloom is expected to be relatively intense again this fall. So imagine Toledo being water insecure because of algae blooms. A lot of that is unnecessary agricultural runoff, and that can be fixed. And that is, that is being fixed through new regulations and, uh, and new monitoring. So the challenge, though, so you think Lake Erie was bad. So if you want job security, you can be an algae scooper in Lake Kunming. Um, I was told not to wade into the water because um, the algae is, is, is uh, nasty. Um, but anyway, so of course, there's California. So I was at the Milken Institute, which is an investor group. They were in talking about in the impact on investing and the impact on the markets for California's supplies. So I chartered a plane and went up at sun sunrise to have a look at California's water supply. And the entire state 
is experiencing an epic drought. I'm sure everybody has been following this. This is 100% abnormally dry in, in the state of California. So when you look at you know, the crops, when you look at the challenges, when you look at California is right now in the crucible re-engineering its policy, re-engineering its water supplies, in talking about the value of water. What crops are they going to grow? Are they going to grow almonds? Will they grow watermelons to ship to Michigan? What will they grow? But another part of the conversation is this, is the migrant workers as well. So you have a migrant workforce in the tens of thousands, and many of them are drinking contaminated water because as the water supplies, the groundwater supplies are diminishing as well. As the groundwater supplies go down, the drinking water becomes more and more saturated with contaminants like fertilizer and pesticides. So not necessarily a, cheerfe a cheerful outlook for California. The snowpack is at a 500-year low. And it's a story of global significance. We convened a group in, um, uh, in Stockholm two weeks ago to talk about the California drought in the global context. But some 17 desalination plants are on the drawing board. But really, the engineering and the plant costs and the energy costs are still 10 times as expensive as the mountain runoff and are still more expensive than, say, replacing all of the toilets with low-flush toil low toilets. So California is, California is being watched by the world to see how they rewrite the regulations and assumptions of supply. So I wanted to go back here. So closing the loop. I mentioned closing the loop. So here's a nuclear power plant. Now notice, power plants, as we mentioned also, besides coal, this is a nuclear plant, but any power plant needs water for cooling for the most part. Some are air-cooled. But this plant, the Palo Verde plant near Phoenix, would not be possible without wastewater, without sewage, the sewage flow. So they pumped the sewage from Phoenix here to cool the power plant, partially treated. It would not be possible. So we're going to see a lot more closing the loop. So how many people have been to Singapore? So if they hear that you're interested in water, they'll actually pick you up at the airport, and they'll take you to the water treatment plant. And then they'll give you, so would you like a bottle of water? I had to bring this along. They'll give you a bottle of new water. That's what it says, new water. This is water out of the other side of the wastewater treatment plant. So it is new water. I mean, it's the same water the dinosaurs drank. Um, and the reason they're doing that is because of water security. Singapore gets all of its water now, most of its water, not all of it, but most of it from Malaysia, just across the way. So Singapore has a national security issue. They are building massive plants to close the loop, not desalination plants, but really sewage, water treatment plants. So it's a lot easier, actually, to treat wastewater than, than to desalinate. So some other trends we're seeing are the financing water and sanitation for health, education, and for equity. It's amazing what happens when you bring safe water to, com to poor communities, like this one in Manila. Um, we had a meeting at the Asian Development Bank, and so the night before my flight got in at, at midnight, I went and stayed overnight in one of the slums and photographed all night and photographed early into the morning uh, families waking up, and this community was one of the few. These were favelas, these were little shanties um, that had no sanitation, but they had safe drinking water. And so the kids were healthy, and the kids were clean, and people were actually were, were working. And the other trends, too, I was ta talking a little earlier um, uh, beforehand about Mongolia, but other countries, people are actually coming together. A fun little story here is, is the World Economic Forum, we do scenario sessions and, and discussion leadership with uh, different parts of the world, and whether it's in Davos or whether it's in Parliament in Mongolia. And so you'll see, see my chair right there. What we did is we, for the first time in Parliament, noticed everybody faces forward here, and actually the podium is over here. So you would see the back of your colleagues' heads, basically, practically, for your entire term. So to the consternation of the security people back over here, we actually turned the chairs around. I said, we don't do that. And, well, we, sorry, we just did. Um, and I got in a little bit of trouble because I, as you see, I took this picture. Um, first off, I brought in the big camera, which according to the security briefing was not allowed. And then I snuck over and I took my shoes off and stood on a chair in Parliament. And a staff member got a picture of me. And um, the caption was, Ganter at work, you can't take him anywhere, including Mongolian Parliament. But it was a historic picture. So another big trend we're seeing, too, is we're talking about systemic risk. So three or four or five years ago, we were talking about water. 
now we're talking about uh, we're talking about geopolitical risk. We're talking about uh, global supply chain risk at companies. If you're Coca-Cola, you're interested in where your aluminum comes from, how much water it uses, how much sugar, where your sugar comes from. Is your sugar plantation sustainable? Are you using water appropriately? Even if you're Unilever, you're, you're now worried about deforestation and palm oil and how much water, how that affects the water supplies of the area. So we're looking at systemic risk. I've been hinting at that water is a water, food, energy nexus. You cannot separate the three. So systemic risk has really become the big story, particularly in the boardrooms. How do you, you, you know, the whole idea of corporate responsibility and nice messaging, that's, I don't want to say passe, but again, the chairman of Nestle said flat out, he said, I don't believe in corporate responsibility. I believe in, in putting money on the table. That's why they, he said they put down half a billion dollars for watershed restoration in Central America, half a billion. Not just some, not just some PR, but half a billion because they're worried about their coffee supplies. And the trends. So I'm a news guy. So we started covering this. We started Circle of Blue 14 years ago. And the whole idea was to bring together superheroes in journalism and science and data and design. And most of the time was, there's a water crisis, really? Particularly when we look out the window here. But I remember going to funders and spending 90% of the time talking about a water crisis and 10% about how to fix it. Now that is entirely flipped. I don't think anybody um, doesn't realize there's a water crisis. They're just wondering what to do. But then also, well, what to do? From here in Traverse City, um, we were pretty excited to hear from the State Department that we played a role in the U.S.-China climate talks. So of the six main talking points um, that our president and the president of China uh, discussed at the climate conference that last November a year ago, um, we were, our language is included in two of them. So right here in Traverse City from Building 50, uh, it, was, it was pretty exciting and, and uh, gratifying to have a role in, in uh, China's politics and China's discussions. So if we go back to Wu Yun, remember her and the, the wells and the coal mines. If we fast forward a year from that, when that picture was, that was four years ago, the coal mines had come much closer and the grasslands had, had dried even more. This is her sister's father-in-law at about a two-hour ride by motorcycle uh, from that site. And that's dune grass, similar that you would find in Sleeping Bear. And Wee Yun is much more introspective about the quality of her future, about the future of her family's, family's sheep, sheep herds. She's studying to be a, an accountant um, in, uh, in Shillinghat, Inner Mongolia. So if we fast forward again, I went back again the third time. Uh, the coal mines had gotten bigger here. New coal, mine, new coal processing facility, new rail lines, all feeding China's growth, all feeding China's coal, coal hunger. And the mines had gotten deeper. And also what little groundwater there was left is not fit to drink. So we survived, when I was there, I, I stayed for three days. We lived on Google Translate or her version of Google Translate on their, on their smartphone. And her, she told me that her mother and father, it's your mother and father, will end up selling the farm, uh, the pastures, to the coal mine in the next few years. But life goes on, right? So when I was there two years ago, a year and a half ago, Wu Yun was getting married. So I did her engagement portrait. And this is now her husband. So, okay, fast forward one more time. Well, I'm a little jet lagged tonight. So on Saturday, I went back and took Wu Yun to the same spot. Uh, the coal mines are still here and here and over here now and over behind us now. So on Saturday, we went out to find her father who was out herding sheep. And yet, as you see, this is the grasslands, and the mines are absolutely massive. And they have to haul the water in for the sheep. And they've gotten bigger. It's the same mine as you see here. And their house is right up here, right next to the mines. So I do that because the water crisis is personal. And you know, we live on the blue planet, as, as Jerry will tell you as Jerry knows so viscerally. And when Jerry was looking down for four months on Mirror, 
Um, he picked one spot to live. He picked a place that had probably the greatest water security he could find, a place where he could go swimming every day if he wanted to, right here in the middle of the Great Lakes. So with that, um, it's, it's an honor to be living here. It's an honor to be representing the world from here in many ways and to be part of such a community of so many organizations that are doing so many great things on the front lines of the global water, water crisis. Every single one of these organizations and many more are really here on the front lines. The, the Water Studies Institute working in China, um, Flow for Water working on water policy. So just a few examples. So thank you very much and I'd love to take some questions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would be happy to have your questions, and we have another audience uh, in the next building, uh, and the students will be tweeting their questions to Connor, and Connor will uh, be able to uh, relay those questions to us. They've been enjoying pizza and the same lecture that you see here. So uh, if, you w if you can stand, give us your first name and uh, offer your question, and we'll take it from there. I want to point out, too, Connor's one of our interns this summer, so Connor's hanging on here, and an NMC student. Yeah. I do, yeah. Oh, Connor's got So the first question is, what impact does population have on water security? What impact does population have on water security? Well, a larger population uses more water, um, needs more, uh, more products, uh, more energy. Um, let, me, let me punch ahead here to a couple pictures I left out. Remember, the, uh, remember Manila, uh, the picture I showed? So Manila water brought, brought these, little pipe, these little pipes to this community, this slum in uh, uh, outs called, called Cuatro um, in the Philippines. And what happened was really transformative when they brought safe water. Um, the morning at 4.30 in the morning, this is when I, was, when I stayed overnight there, um, the streets actually started bustling with, with uh, uh, vendors actually selling products. They weren't able to sell anything before they had safe water because they had to spend half of their income buying water from the, we call them the water mafia. These trucks had come through. Imagine spending 40% of your income buying water every day. Imagine, imagine spending 40% for your water, your safe drinking water, and not even knowing if it was safe. So also what was happening here is little stores would pop up because all of a sudden you had extra, extra, you know, extra finance, extra money. Um, still didn't have sanitation. Still asked the question why the chicken crossed the sewage canal. Um, and you saw her, but then Omar really caught my attention because he was a, a young man who was a beggar. Every day he would hop the back of a bus and his one arm is deformed, so he'd hold on to the bus and ride into town and beg all day and come back. Now Omar works for his uncle, who's a fishmonger, goes and buys fish, brings it, sells it in the community, and then he goes to school. So a long-winded answer is, so if they found when you bring water sanitation uh, to communities, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Bangladesh, the population rate actually drops. The education rate goes up. Young women get educated, get get it, get an education. Um, the the gender gap starts to close. It's really transformative. So sorry, I happen to have some pictures that I think worked. I hope. Um, Phil Thomas, wait, if you would wait for that uh, microphone. You talked about value. Uh, what about pricing? Could you tell us a little bit uh, about the role of prices reflecting uh, to the true value of water? Right, the role of prices reflecting the true value of water. That's, that's one of the next big stories. And for the last uh, five or six years, we've been doing an annual survey at Circle of Blue of water prices across the nation. And we've seen you know, prices are edging up. So the true value of water, now right now in most communities, if you're a business or an industry, the more water you, you use, the price actually goes down. You get a bulk discount. But there's no discount for the amount of electricity used that necessary to move that water or to treat it. So what we're going to see is we're going to see tiered pricing most likely. And in some places like Santa Fe, they're doing that. 
What we're also going to see is, in addition to the tiered pricing, we hear a lot about, we've heard a lot about the human right to water. That was a big discussion um, in the UN Sustainable Development Goals a few years ago and, and other issues, you know, very, very vigorous protests around the human right to water. What we're seeing is we're seeing the companies come together with the nonprofits and even and the advocacy groups saying, okay, we can agree on a human right to water. This much is free. So if you live in Quattro, this much water is free, enough to bathe, enough to drink, enough to cook. If you use this much and you actually open a business and start, start a small laundry or a car wash or something else, then your price will actually go up. So you'll actually start paying the true the real cost of, of water. That's a really big point. Yeah, other questions? Oh. Uh, another question is, do you see Circle of Blue expanding and taking on more people and projects? Oh, well, hey. <laughs> Where'd that come from? I, really? I, yeah. <laughs> and do you have any jobs available? I think he's <laughs> looking for a job here. Um, we have a core team of eight here. When we did China, we scaled to 40. Um, I mean, really, we need situation room level approach on this. It's humbling, it's a little scary, actually, that we're the ones doing this. And we're, we're doing this from the former asylum here in Traverse City. Um, but what it does show is that, you know, water, water is the big story on the planet. The sad part, the tough part is, we're journalists, we also combine, you know, we're also aligned with scientists and data researchers, um, but the journalism community is declining. Um, the resources available to journalists to tell these big stories. And so, yes, a long-winded answer, we need to grow. This is the biggest story on the planet right now, and you know, we're humbled and really honored that we're driving it from here. Where do I have a microphone? Over there, there we go, in the back. Uh, good evening. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Last night, uh, I watched uh, Senator Rubio from Florida talk very vigorously, and the, the impression I got that he was defending the coal industry as being essential to our economy and for jobs, uh, to uh, uh, promote new jobs. Uh, my question is, do you think this topic should be part of the presidential candidate's agenda, and I think it should be, but I don't know why it hasn't been addressed yet. What's your opinion on that? Well, there are two pieces to that. So one, so one the coal thing, let me, let me go back to China for a second. I mean, it's just standing in the coal mines um, on Saturday and Sunday. But next to the coal mines, huge solar farm in, in the Xilin Hut. This is, it was new this year massive solar farm and you fly over inner Mongolia and you look down you see all these little sticks and you realize that they're all wind farms. So China's playing the game. They know that they can't rely on coal, probably because of the water issue, but then go to India. India flat out doesn't have the water to, to grow their coal industry the way that they would like to. Um, so as far as discussing in the campaign, I think we need to talk about water and energy and food in a holistic way. At the economic forum, we've practically tattooed on, on foreheads the water, food, energy nexus. You can't have one without the other. And you push on one side and it squirts up a bit on the other side. There's a, there's a, a reaction there. So the coal industry here, that's shifting, that's changing. Just look again to China. I spoke to a venture capital investor in China long time is one of the first VCs in, in Beijing. And I asked him, he's, he's investing heavily in green technology and making solar much more efficient. And I said, well, don't you, I just came from the coal mines, this is last year, don't you get pushed back from the big coal companies? And he said, no, they're, they're my biggest investors. Um, so the coal companies really should be looking at this. Now, another piece to ask, if you have the chance to ask a question, whether a presidential debate or one-on-one or, -on -one or in a, in a Round, in a forum, is ask about the infrastructure. Ask about the infrastructure needs in the US. Every day we re read about a water main breaking somewhere, sometimes 100 years old. Um, we are a trillion dollars backlogged in water and wastewater infrastructure alone. We're 20 billion dollars behind in the Great Lakes alone. We have sewage treatment plants that when it rains hard, they overflow raw sewage into our Great Lakes, into our drinking water. How do we let that happen? 
So there's a big, there's actually a huge opportunity. The finance, finance world is trying to figure out how to crack that, how to invest in sewage treatment plants. But it comes back to your point about the value of water. So if we have that conversation nationally and actually value water at its true value, then the financial markets can actually figure out how to invest in bringing and managing safe water supplies. I should have mentioned uh, on the right side of the stage, Hans von Summeren, I believe, is here, and uh, the director of the Freshwater Studies Institute at Northwestern Michigan College, one of the leading institutes in this country looking at freshwater issues. And uh, I think we should be very proud and, and very happy uh, that we have that kind of leadership here at NMC and that they are studying exactly these kinds of problems. We have a question in the back. Yes, Mr. Ganter, uh, fracking is a big issue uh, here in Michigan and elsewhere uh, as a method of uh, oil drilling because it apparently uh, requires a vast amount of water and the water apparently is contaminated, can't be reused. Uh, as a citizen, I have no idea how seriously to take that as a threat to uh, groundwater. Could you say something on that? Sure, I can say you know, really and two things. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm not a hydrologist. I'm not a geologist. Um, but when we come, when I, when I ask scientists, when I ask uh, researchers, I was up at the up at the uh, the tar sands in Alberta. You've probably heard of these massive um, mining operations for for um, bitumen. Um, and I asked them. It takes a lot of water to do that too. It's very similar, except they use steam. And I asked about that, and he said, you know, he, got, he, he said, we're working on the technology, but he said, the price of oil, I mean, not right now, because the price of oil is way down, but the price of oil will be determined by the value of water. So the big question that we need to be, the big debate we need to be having is, do we want to contaminate that water? Do we want to push it down further in deep well injections where we'll never have access to it again? That's a big, huge ethical and, and and just resource management question. Um, the other piece of that, I was on the plane coming back from China a year ago, sitting next to an executive of a major company whose brand you would recognize, and he said they, you know, they have equipment that's at fracking sites and that treats water and, and part of the part of the you know drilling the wells. They don't put their logos on the equipment in case something goes wrong. So there is a serious fear that there will be, you know, that there is or will be serious failures with fracking wells. Now, you know, is there a trade-off? Um, that's something I'd, I'd love to, you know, it'd, it'd be great. We could probably do a, uh, you know, multi-day session on it, and we should. As the blue economy takes off, do you see harmful pesticides and fertilizers being outlawed? As the blue economy, blue economy, yes. blue economy. Yeah. so as the value being outlawed. Now that's a really interesting question. I don't see the being because we have to grow food, right? Yeah. Um, are we? Do we need pesticides? Um, organic, you know, that that brings in a whole another question. But I actually sat down with some of the executives from the fertilizer industry. This is the ex this is the advantage of of going to these you know, the economic forum in Davos. They're really worried because when they see pictures from Lake Erie they're the ones being blamed. And so they are trying to pivot very quickly and educate farmers and educate um, you know, regulators as to how much fertilizer is actually necessary and how to control runoff with simple things like berms and, and green belts. Um, but you know, to shut down water, water for Toledo from runoff for, from farms, What's the chances that sometime in the hopefully near future, salinization would be the uh, part of the uh, answer to this problem? Uh, desalination. Now, the one thing, so what we need are some major technology breakthroughs, and whether it's nanotechnology or membranes or whatever, the, the bottom line with desal, the really easy thing is, is it's complicated and it's expensive and it takes a lot of energy to run desal plants. So for the most part, uh, we will never use desal water for growing food. And growing food accounts for about 70 to 80 percent of our water use. So when you're looking at, say, buffering a major drought situation, if you're in Los Angeles, 
you might be willing to spend a few hundred million dollars to build a desal plant as insurance. But you're not going to build desal plants for, for ag, at least right now. And it also, it does take a long time for new technologies to actually come to market. Um, it's a new, new breakthrough today isn't going to be in the market tomorrow. <laughs> Carl, uh, this was so interesting, but I'm wondering if you would please promise us, as you, as you travel these water-scarce areas, to not tell people about the Great Lakes. <laughs> Don't show that picture, you know, from, from on high. Don't show, the, show the sludge in Lake Erie. Right. <laughs> but, don't show the Great Lakes. I, I, bring, I bring you algae bloom. <laughs> yes. Thank you. It's a shocking percentage of the world's fresh water. It's 20 percent, I mean, Hans, you know, is out in the bay every day, and 20 percent of the world's surface fresh water is right here. I mean, imagine that. 30 million people get their water from the Great Lakes Basin, I believe. And, you know, how do we manage that? And how do we take care of it? The world, that's a really good point, because the world is, is looking at us for leadership. And there is an initiative called the Blue Economy, uh, Michigan's Blue Economy. How can we bring new technology, development, et cetera? It's really focused more on, on the U.S. and more in the region. I think it can be global. You know, this is the, the Water Studies Institute is global and is driving leadership in policy thought and research right from here, from NMC. So, since shifting uh, from talking about blue problems to blue solutions, what talking points have proven the most effective? Ah, um, you know, fear. <laughs> Seriously, um, fear has probably been the most effective, particularly in the corporate world. Um, the hope side, well, that's kind of nice. That'll be for the next, you know, the next term, the next quarterly report. But fear had this. I hate to say, the, the Global Risk Report has been a huge lever. Um, last year, we were number three, okay, so that was great. We, you know, hey, we're number three. Um, this year, number one, number one crises, and all you have to do is tick off and say, your supply chain's at risk, there'll be protesters here, all you have to do is go to Peru and go to the Catamarca mine and literally get out of the cab and there's a protest. And it wasn't for us, I mean, it wasn't orchestrated. Um, and so that's a five, it's five billion dollars on the line. So you have companies right now, there, there's a, a trade organization called Ceres, which is working to put r these risks into corporate annual reports for full disclosure of their water risks. So f I would say, unfortunately, fear is the big driver, um, but then also coming back to the pricing and the value of water. If we can change that conversation nationally through the elections, through municipalities, in the finance world, we can actually really drive a sustainable blue economy across the U.S. We can fix leaky pipes. We can, you know, we can actually manage the water that we have. What is your view on corporations that sell, take our water and sell bottled water? Ah, sell bottled water. Well. You know, I have some new water for you. Um, I don't, you know, I don't drink bottled water personally unless I, unless I have to. If I'm in China, I drink bottled water from a reputable source. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lifestyle choice. And when you look at the cost, when you look at the amount of the plastics that's, that are actually recycled and how low that is, when you look at the amount of energy that it takes to process the water and package the water, that's a really big question. I'm, I'm not a drinker because of that. Question down here. Is it all the way in the back, sir. Oh, in the back. Previous Sorry. organizations that was listed on uh, one of your slides was On the Ground, which I understand is a fantastic local organization. Uh, but they deal predominantly with farmers in developing regions. So why should Traverse City residents be concerned about water scarcities in developing region communities? Ah, that's a really good question. Why should we be on the, on the, on the global stage? Well, one, there's an opportunity for leadership and, and doing good. Um, you know, there's nothing better than going to a community and helping build a water supply and seeing, you know, kids seeing healthy growth. Now, a company like Higher Grounds Coffee, it makes perfect sense. I mean, it's a perfect symbiotic relationship because they need coffee. 
So why not invest in those communities and invest in sustainable jobs and health and, um, and agriculture and water supplies? Because if there's a sustainable water supply, they'll have workers and they'll, ox they'll also have coffee supplies. Now again, back to the huge side, somebody like Nestle, why would they invest um, half a billion dollars in watershed? Because they're terrified of not only their coffee supplies, but they're afraid that if there's not a reliable crop, that they'll lose their workforce. Uh, just to, to uh, add something to that thought, that gentleman's thought, the uh, next month speaker, Sarah Chase, at the uh, Opera House, oh, will talk about Afghanistan. And when I was traveling in Afghanistan, there were three things that people in invariably mentioned that they wanted. Uh, at nowhere on the list, by the way, was a stronger army, which is what we were giving them. What they wanted was water, clean, a health care system, and a legal system that actually worked without corruption. So water was at the top of their list. How is this community preparing to address policy issues to help protect water resources? Uh, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, is Jim Olson in the, in the audience? There's Jim right there. Um, Jim, do you want to say a few words? Because that's the, the Water Studies Institute, it's, and, and Jim's been leading this. Another credit is, is yeah, when well, I was about 15, Jim introduced me to this, so, so this is all Jim's fault. <laughs> well, thank you for your uh, presentation this evening, first of all, Carl, and, and to the forum. This is terrific to uh, have this discussion continuing in our community. At the Water Studies Institute, uh, uh, about three years ago with, with uh, leaders at the college and uh, help from the Biederman Foundation, we looked at starting a water policy program at the Water Studies Institute, which has been freshwater science based. Uh, we just completed the first class last spring. Uh, those that made it through did very well. In fact, all of them did very well and they're on to other careers taking the problems that we've looked at even tonight, which is, you know, not, I think you've more than scratched the surface, Carl, but uh, it's multiplied everywhere. What the Water Studies Program has done is taken some of the uh, pioneering work of Circle of Blue, particularly this nexus between food, water, and energy, and we're developing a three-part course, and we have developed it, as I said, it's offered again this winter, not only for, well, students of all ages, because it affects all of us. And the focus of this is the three parts are food, water, and energy, and how they interact, and you've seen a little bit, bit of that this evening. The second uh, part of that is the science of the water cycle, because climate change really is a diversion, and we saw the piece of the coal mine in northern China, and there in northern China you have coal exhausting water supplies to go to Beijing to create more climate change which evaporates water more quickly than it falls and dislocates it around the planet causing things to even be worse. So we're looking at the, the nexus and the water cycle and then what are the legal principles and policies around the world that have worked from ancient times until now and how might they work in the future? And we have discovered, and that's some of the work of Flo, this course was actually designed by Flo, which is uh, another one of those small water groups here wanting to do uh, larger things <laughs> out of Traverse City. And we have this, been able to develop this principle and policy and begin to apply it to things like algal blooms, to things like water diversions and competition between countries or landowners, um, competition between energy and food and oil, all of that. Uh, and it has been astounding how the students have picked this up. And I think what it does is allows our community and this college and this Water Studies Institute to begin to prepare people for this century. And it's really exciting to just be a small part of, part of watching this grow. Oh, we talked so about thanks for that. Short question and the time to have a long answer. <laughs> well, we talk about scaling, though. I mean, this is a global problem. And, you know, th why Traverse City, this is happening right here. We have the leadership position. Uh, nope. Not right okay. Now. We have another question in the audience. 
Uh, microphone. Oh. There we go. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, uh, Jim Olson just mentioned uh, legal rights. You mentioned an er interesting example earlier about a rice farmer in Australia who found it more profitable to sell his water rights than to grow rice. Is that a something that could be applicable, say, in California? Could we get to a point where an almond farmer would find it more profitable to sell water rights than to grow almonds? And right. Would that be a better way to go than building desalinization plants? The, I'll tell you what, there are uh, the Australians, there are a lot of Australians in California right now and a lot of Californians in Australia um, learning how they, you know, how they fix that. Um, they're, there's a lot of discussion around that. Jim probably knows a lot more about, about the, the legal shifts there and how you lease or sell your water rights. It's more likely leasing your water rights. Um, but that's a huge, huge trend. Last question. Uh, okay, right there. Right there. Is it possible for the federal government to take or divert our Great Lakes water? Ah, well, Jim's in the back right behind you, too. Um, Jim has played a major role in this in, in years. Jim, is that, okay, if you want to respond to that? It's a very complicated question, but under our Constitution, the federal government is the supreme law of the land, and there's a tension between what rights the federal government has in water, because essentially water is property of the states. When each state joined the nation, that water, under what's called the Equal Footing Doctrine, became titled in each state. And these are the navigable waters, uh, our surface waters. Groundwater feeds those, so it's one whole uh, singular system. So uh, traditionally and legally, the water is the state. So the question is, how could the federal government do that? Uh, they kind of have a problem because of what I just told you, but because of what's called the navigation power and the commerce power, Congress can affirmatively do things like the Bureau of Reclamation Project and the famous TVA project. But they have to do it in connecting with federal lands or they have to condemn private lands to accumulate the water rights in order to do the project. So if it's not a true navigation project, I would argue that uh, it cannot be done. But I assure you, that's just one opinion. And it's going to be something we'll be uh, facing uh, this probably in the next decade. Well, Jim Olson has just revealed how optimistic a man he is to say that Congress can do anything. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to uh, uh, say a uh, word of appreciation for the people over at Scholars Hall. These are our future merchant mariners, our future Freshwater Studies Institute graduates, and uh, a wonderful group of young people, and I want to thank Connor for being the connection to them. And I want to thank you for being here, and most of all, I want to thank Carl Ganter for a terrific Thank you, Jeff.